Oh, everyone, not the tactical insight we wanted to do, but we've got to discuss the buying game. Frustrations? Positives? I think so. But of course, everyone's generally frustrated, by the way. The last three games have gone three games without a win. Our Premier League title race still alive, but not, at, not in our hands. We know what City are like. And a missed opportunity it feels against a Bayern side that, OK, are good. I've talked a lot about how they were good. In fact, my predictions for these games were a 2-1 home win and a 1-1 draw there. So I wasn't miles off. I just thought we'd have enough to find a way over them, but we didn't. We need to understand why. I think Arteta can be questioned when it comes to squad management, tactics at times. There's some things we did well. You've got to praise Bayern Munich and Thomas Tuchel because there's another team that are trying to stop us as well. But amongst all this, Graham is here to join me. And I know that you wanted to start with something different that you just wanted to say before we go into what is going to be, we hope, uh, constructive criticism of a young team um, that has a long way to go. But let's be real, has got some things wrong recently. Yes, James. No, no one loves this team more than me, James. No one loves this manager uh, more than me. I think we are a really good, well-coached, well-structured side. But when you get in the quarterfinals of a Champions League, you're going to be playing against a team who are equally as well-coached and well-structured as Bayern Munich were last night. And I think when I listen to coaches who talk about games at that level, they always talk about these sort of games are decided by individuality, individual bravery. You've got to have the desire, bravery and killer instinct to take these games by the scruff of the neck and affect the outcome because they're always so tight. And I think last night, if I've got any criticism of Arsenal, I think we saw we lacked that killer instinct when we had our moments. It was always going to be a game of fine margins, James. And I didn't think our forwards stepped up to the plate last night. And, and that, for me, has sort of like reunited, uh, reignited the uh, debate on whether we have got the forwards or a forward player to mm -hmm. take us to that next level. Because I thought last night we had chances we didn't take. I thought all three forward players were guilty of performing under par. And even when Jesus came off the bench, he was equally as poor. I thought Bayern um, had players missing last night, so it was a great opportunity for us. Um, I didn't think we, we looked great in secure possession. We didn't make the most of our transitions and our turnovers. They were obviously looking to play counter-attack. And in the end, we switched off for the goal that won the game. But I think the biggest indictment overall for us, as poor as we was offensively last night, and I want to have that debate about our forward line today, is I think we lost the game at the Emirates. We were one up in control. Mm -hmm. uh, ben White had a great chance to make it two, but we were in control of that game and then sloppy defensively there. So I think in the first leg, our defence, which has been the cornerstone of everything that we've done well this season, uh, let us down in that game. And then last night, I thought our forwards, when it really mattered, and I'm going to point the finger at not only Havertz and Martinelli, but also Bakaya Saka because when we needed these players to actually step up and perform last night, they couldn't deliver. And I think we were never going to win the Champions League this year. I'd never thought that. I honestly didn't believe that. It's a, it's, a, it's a process. We're back in after seven years. To ask the young team to go and win it in the first year, probably weren't going to do it. But I, I'm just disappointed at the fact that we went out on a whimper. Yeah, I think that's it. Not throwing the kitchen, kitchen sink at it. Turkish talked about it in his fan cam a lot. Why did we... And it's true, the Villa game, why does it feel like these games ended with us as fans feeling like we didn't really leave it all out there? I just thought Arsenal under Arteta were better at this a year ago, two years ago, where we looked like we were at least able to throw everything at it. Um, I didn't see this in this team. And tiredness gets brought up and other things. So we're going to explore it all. And I think what you said about loving the team and loving the players, I, I love this team too. Um, I think Arteta is going to be, whether it's with Arsenal or with someone else, a very successful manager who wins big trophies. Um, the question is, how long have we got to wait? How long should a club like Arsenal be patient? Then the other question is, stick or twist? I'm not here to have the big manager conversation. I think what I'm just trying to say is, I think he'll get there. I'm with you. I've got all the time well for Mikel Arteta. But there's a lot I want to be critical of as well in this video because I think... Small-minded James, who, you know, what I know Arteta's already forgotten in the game, can't understand why Arteta, for me, made some really basic errors in this, in this game, in my opinion. So let's, let's get all into it. We're going to fly through the match stats quickly, just to 
say that you know Bayern had more shots which surprised me as they had more possession which surprised me as well it didn't feel the game went that way a better xg you then go to the attacking stats where you can see we've got into the final third a lot we had a lot of deep touches i think that's where i had this false sense of domination from not domination of us from arsenal but a degree of control field tilt zone 14 touches tells you that we got in some okay areas we never did enough to hurt them and the the defensive numbers are there clearly we went to press them and engage quite quickly so arsenal it counts for nothing, but the numbers look okay. But whatever, part of that aside doesn't mean anything because we know what we did with it. Let's talk about the 11 first, and let's talk about the plan. Because amongst the things that are there to be criticised, I think you've got to say one thing about Arsenal and Arteta and be fair. We can't just throw our toys out the pram and go, oh, we were crap. Oh, well, we went into these games and we bottled it. Well, we should be three and a half half time against Villa. And I thought that was a good half away at Bayern. I think there were things that were fairly encouraging. So what was the plan from both teams from the off? I thought Arsenal would have been really happy with that first half last night. I mean, you go to an away stadium, it's, it's in effect a one-off cup tie, isn't it? It's 2-2 mm -hmm. from the first leg, there's no away goals. I thought the plans were clear early on, and I think both sides had a threat that they tried to nullify, the, the opposition tried to nullify. I think what you saw, Arsenal recognised that Leroy Sane mm -hmm. was their main threat down this side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Tommy Asu came back in last night I and agree. left back. And I think what Arteta asked uh, Martinelli to do was to get back here so we had like a 2v1. Yeah, he when definitely did. Sane had the ball. So I think Arsenal were obviously worried about Sane. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they had plans for stopping Sane. And in the end, uh, as you're going to break down, it was his cross when. He was faced with a 2v1, but still got the cross in, mm. that ultimately led to the goal when it came back in from the other side. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this was a fascinating battle. If we put them right in the corner where Martinelli so often, I think, found himself in this position, so Tommy Asu could yeah. tuck in a little bit, yeah. but you're right. Yeah. But then we had the same on this side, didn't we? Yeah. With exactly. Saka. Yeah, so what they did, they obviously recognised Saka. 42% of our attacks went down the right side last night. And yeah. I think they had plans for Saka. As you say, they had the two players across there to deal with Saka. Made who, that look who terrible, let's do it again. Who, who basically could not really influence the game on that side. So um, yeah. that was the, I think both sides recognised who their most dangerous opponent was, was and both sides set up to nullify that. That was what we saw. I thought in the game, Arsenal were trying to invite Bayern onto their press mm -hmm. to try and get transitional moments, turnovers, to try and get players into play. Because I thought in secure possession, we didn't offer very much. We struggled to play through them. But when we did have our moments, when mm. we did uh, uh, succeed in what the game plan was, to turn them over by our press, we made the poor decisions. We made the wrong, played the wrong pass, yeah. or held onto the ball too long, or didn't get the players into the box to make the best of it. So I thought Arsenal's plans were clear to press high, win the ball in transition. I thought Bayern, strangely, even though they were a home team, were quite content playing two holding midfielders, Goretzka and Lerma. There we go. Yeah. Is that L Lima and Goretzka? Lima, yeah. sorry, Lima, yeah. Lima and Goretzka. They played like two holding midfielders. They, they played a more attacking formation, mm -hmm. funny enough, at the Emirates, but they yeah, were without key players like Canabri. Obviously, Alfonso Davis was missing. Uh, and so he, he wanted security and he wanted to try and win that midfield battle. Mm -hmm. So you had like Jorginho and Rice for Arsenal and you had their two DMs on their side. So they were more, I thought, set up to play the counter. They, mm -hmm. they wanted to stay in the game. So the game was very tight. It was a tight game, the complete opposite to what it was at the Emirates. Yeah. Arsenal were more attacking at the Emirates, which enabled them to play through us more. So it was a more tight game with a, a rigid setup. It was always going to be a close, probably one goal match. I agree. Neither team gave each other too much. No. I mean, I felt talking about the rest of the, the plan generally from Arsenal. I mean, Kai Havertz led the line. I thought he had a poor game, if I'm really yep. honest. Erdegaard was floating to these eight spaces, but I felt that Rice was quite reluctant to... I mean, in the first game, he was really high in this area, which really surprised me. He was a little bit close. I mean, we've seen from past networks that he's almost right there to facilitate Jorginho drifting right a little bit. And this is why, I mean, you mentioned it. We may as well get the graphic up. 32% yeah. uh, of our attacks went down the left, 24% uh, down the middle, and 44% down the right because, you know, we are so primed to play in this area of the pitch. Now, at times, to be fair, if we just clear all this... Uh, yeah, let's clear all this. There were, 
I'm making a mess of this, sorry guys. Go again. There were times where Tomiyasu inverted here so that Gabriel, Saliba and White could split. White was actually very central at times in possession and build-up. But it just felt like Arsenal were quite reluctant to get Rice too far away from Jorginho and we were just lacked a little bit of help down this. I mean, like I said, you look at past networks, I'm pretty sure this space, as always, is completely and utterly... Let's do it in a... What colour? Let's do it in a red. I mean, that space, once again, was just not... was just vacated by us. We didn't really have anything there to link up with Martinelli, to underlap, to support Kai Havertz, nothing. Yeah, and I think that was reflected in the fact that our two fullbacks were very conservative on the night. Yeah. I think White and Tommy Astu were too safe, didn't really get forward enough, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. I thought that Declan Rice was trying to influence the play, um, but I thought the one player we had again who mm -hmm. was, I think, uh, without being outstanding, was at a different level, trying to make a difference individually to influence the game, was Martin Odegaard. Mm -hmm. I thought he was the one player with his playmaking, he tried. Who sure. tried to sort of like mm -hmm. make a difference, to be brave. We, mm -hmm. we didn't have enough brave players on the night, enough players with the courage to influence the game. He was the only one for me uh, who stood out, and he was the one who he played. Was frustrating at times as well, though. But yeah, yeah, but he, tried. he was the one who played the pass in. So when yeah. Martinelli, who mm. gets central in that first yeah, half, you're right, did, finds yeah. himself in that position, it came from a, 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 a run and a pass from Odegaard. Yeah, you're right. It was and good. he was the one who created that opening for uh, Martinelli. I thought in the first half, I thought you talked about the lack of width on the left-hand side with Tommy Asu not getting forward. I did think Gabriel Martinelli had a couple of good runs on mm. the outside. Yeah. And then, then I talk about our forward players. Kai Havertz, I think, doesn't do well enough in two occasions when he's in good positions in the box. Martinelli, put, uh, in the first half, got a really good cross in that I think he should get attack see it's recognized that Martinelli could get that cross in. He just doesn't react quick enough and he gets blocked off. I think an elite forward attacks it better. Attacks it better. Harry yeah. Kane gets in there. Mm -hmm. So and he had another situation in the first half where I think he didn't recognise the space he had and doubled back when he was in a good mm -hmm. position. So Saka was having his problems on the right hand side. Martinelli generally was I thought had a, a poor game, but he did create that one opening that we could have mm -hmm. done better with and he had that chance which he didn't take. Mm -hmm. You know, these were in a game of fine margins, which Mikel called yeah, it. Big moments. Big yeah. moments. The, yeah. uh, we talked about the Trossard miss against Villa of the weekend being a big moment. And I thought that Martinelli miss in the first half was the big moment last night. Yeah. In a game that was always going to be a fine margins. We need individuals. It, it, a mm -hmm. tight game like this, individuals to step up, to mm -hmm. have the bravery to make a difference and I think they, yeah. we lack a killer instinct in our front line. So you've touched on a few things there that I was actually going to leave to later in the show but you know what, let's go through them now. Firstly, their goal because the reason I'm talking about this goal now is you talked about a moment, a moment, right? Sane makes that moment happen so it ends up wide with Guerrero and then I've tried to illustrate as best as possible where everyone's standing but Kimmich essentially sneaks around Martinelli this area of the pitch isn't being looked after because, to be fair, Saliba's got the near post fine. Gabriel is marking Kane. I think White should do better to stop the cross. But you know yes. what? Sometimes, sometimes you get done and the ball comes into the box. I'm not saying it's good enough, but that's actually twice now we've seen it. With Guerrero in this game, we saw it with Digne's cross for the Villa opener the yeah. other day. And I said there was a clip, or I think AFTV you know, shared before the Villa game, that we have struggled against teams that get wings, ba wing backs and full backs really high up the pitch. We don't seem to defend crosses like that that well. Look at the, the Willock assist at Newcastle, for example. So Kimmich comes steaming in, and this is what you mean about, look, it's a good, it's a good team goal, but really, it's just kind of a moment of quality. It's a good run, it's a really good cross into a nice area, and goal, and I didn't see, you know, really, the best thing we had close to this was, like you said, the cut back to Martinelli, who he goes with the left foot. He's just trying to get it on target. You can understand that. But really, he's got time to set himself and hit it or pick a spot. And Bayern, to be honest, I thought we played better as an all-round performance in the first half against Bayern. So actually, do I mean that? I probably don't mean that. What I'm trying to say is... We did really well to nullify Bayern in a lot of ways. I know there's a lot of criticism about this performance, and trust me, I've got a lot more to add. But I felt, actually, you're still the away team at the Allianz with the players they've got. We did quite well to start for them and stop them. But 
they had their moment. Where was ours? Where was our quality? Where was our moment? Where was our great cross? Where was our attack in the box? And just look at the players they've got. Sane is making his way back in. Kimmich, Goretzka, Kane, Musiala, all in the box as well. And I can't remember a moment in which Arsenal flooded the box like that and made Bayern sweat to try and get the ball out. As I said, I think they, uh, when we had our controlled possession, they, they smothered us pretty well. They mm -hmm. stopped us from playing through them. I thought, at the start of the second half, James, I thought, a bit like the Villa game on so Sunday, time, there was a talking? slight momentum shift at the start of the second half. So I would, you could almost argue the goal was coming. Yeah. Uh, they started to get on top at the start of the second half. So we had a really good first half. Uh, at one or two moments, it was a good away performance. We were in the game. And I thought, you would have been happy with that first half if you were Arteta. But at the start of the second half, Bayern started to get more mm. of a foothold in the mm -hmm. game. And they start, whether it was fatigue, whether it was they got the momentum going and we, we started to lose control in the game in, in much the same way as we did on Sunday against Aston Villa. So the goal was coming. The irony for me was that Arteta had asked um, Martinelli and Tomiyasu to obviously do a job on Sane on that mm -hmm. side. And they had a 2v1 situation there when the ball goes out to yeah. him, but he still gets the crossing. Yeah, so enough, so we it? didn't really deal with that on that side. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, and we had a, a really good defender in Tomiyasu and Martinelli doubling up. He still gets the crossing. Raya can't take it, but flicks it out to this side. And then, of course, it becomes a bit more chaotic. Yeah. Now, at that stage, as you correctly said, Ben White has got to get out more quicker to stop the, block the cross. And, and no, you know, 60, min 60 odd minutes into a, a game, physicality, mental awareness t through tiredness is starting to probably affect his decision making, you could argue. But he doesn't get out quick enough. Mm -hmm. They get the cross in. Now, when they get the cross in here, you've got two Arsenal players. Martinelli, who's not a defender, admittedly, switches off. And Tommy Asu, could he do better? Could he come across? I know he's weary of the player behind him. He can see the picture. He the can best, see the bigger picture, but can he yeah. come across? He's right. got a defender's instinct. It's easier for Kimmich, though, because he, Kimmich, because he's making a run from deep. He can mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. how the play is going to develop. Arsenal players are reacting to it. He's being proactive. But for all that, I just think we didn't defend it well enough. But I thought there were signs they were getting on top at mm -hmm. the start of the second half. Mm -hmm. And I thought the goal was coming. Yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that. I felt they were getting on top because that happened against Villa as well. Second half. You know, we don't come out, we don't have the control that we did in the first half. When I say control, still nil-nil at half-time in both games, but you felt that there was a performance there we could build on. I've got a real issue with Mikel Arteta's approach to both second halves, because while I've given credit for actually the first half game plans, let's be real, we should have been 3-0 up at half-time against Villa, and in this game, nil-nil, at where the Allianz, having a lot of possession, the better chances fell to us. Missed Barman. the big moment for me. Yeah, you know, you think, OK, there's... Something to, you know, he's clearly coached them well going into this game. But for me, I'm annoyed with his squad management. Squad management comes down to three things for me. Firstly, knowing where best to, play, to place your players. Secondly, knowing how to manage them throughout the season. And third, transfer market. Now, what the hell, I, keep, I want to keep saying this because Mikhail Ted has taken us a long way. What the hell do I know about the transfer market and managing your players throughout the season and the amount of minutes they're playing and their fitness, right? You'll have a whole team. But there are still things that don't look right to me, and I'm going to put them out there, and you let me know in the comment section below if you think I've got a point. Let's start with talking about the subs he made. Because this is point A, knowing where best to place your players. So we've got here Trossard and Jesus, come on. So Jorginho and Marte come off, and at this point, I'm tearing my hair out. I'm thinking, you're joking. Jorginho, our most progressive player. At least maybe get Partey in the team so you can do what we did at the Etihad, get us on the ball a little bit. They come off and Jesus and Trossard come on. So Havertz and Rice revert to the six and the eight position. I have such a massive issue with this. I'm sorry, Graham, I've got such a massive issue because our build-up shape ended up looking like this. Well, I remember what I said players in their best positions. Trossard is not a touchline winger. He's got enough pace to make a little burst like he did against Porto. He's got enough pace to you know, get into some pockets and do some things, take on the old player every now and again. But we had him all the way out there with no support because Havertz would linger on the... Let's move the Bayern players forward a little bit, everyone. Um, Havertz would essentially linger on the last man. That's where he plays. He wants to play here and build up, waiting for it there. Rice is drifting more central 
Erdogan's having to drop deep, so we've removed him from his supporting act next to Saka. And then you've got your, you know, your back four with Tomiyasu inverting. He's not really an inverter. So, again, I just feel like, once again, this area of the pitch, which was already struggling anyway, we'll show it in red, was just left vacated by Arsenal. Havertz doesn't get, he doesn't demand the ball. He's not, and for anyone thinking I'm having a massive go, I'm not having a go at Havertz. It's clearly instruction. I don't believe he's that bad that he goes, I'm just going to stand up here, I don't want to be I'm just going to play where I want. He, I think he's told, wait for an underlap, wait for a ball into the box, get to the back post. But it was basically like playing with 10 men because we lost something in midfield. <laughs> Rice doesn't progress the ball like Jorginho no. does. No. So I know there's a lot of lines, everyone, apologies. But Rice doesn't progress the ball like Jorginho. So Erdogan has to drop in and help. We don't have a Zinchenko to invert, albeit I understand why people didn't want Zinchenko in this game. Tommy Asu isn't a ball progressor like the others, so it just felt like we had no, we didn't earn the right to play. Now Kai Havertz playing in this role frustrates me for some reason. Let me just show you some FB ref numbers. It's just a graphic. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see here this is this is a midfielder set of numbers. He's not a get on the ball, play, pass, and move midfielder. He doesn't do that. And for anyone saying yeah, he's played a lot up front, I get it. That does skew the numbers slightly, but he still played 24 games as an attacking midfielder, as you can see from this graphic from transfer marks. So he's played a lot of football in midfield still this season. And I can't believe that Arteta saw us losing a grip of the game and thought moving Havertz into midfield was the answer because. We, we lost an ability to play through Bayern that we were struggling with anyway, Graham. I think we, you are 100% spot on. I thought watching it last night, although we were struggling uh, in controlled possession, we lost our build-up. Mm. When Giorgino went off, we lost yeah. our build-up. So, um, and ultimately, Havertz is not a ball progressor. No. And, and I think I know why he did it. I think he was... He, he's, over the last few weeks, when he puts uh, Havertz, Trossard, Trossard together, he likes one to come short and one to run mm -hmm. on beyond. It's like that's what he tries to build it, with that relationship on that side. Uh, that's what he was, I think, hoping might happen. But we, we did struggle to actually, in secure possession, play through them, even with Jorginho there, to be fair. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he made the subs, it made no impact at no, all. No. In, fa in fact, if anything, it made us worse. Yep. And we did the last 20 minutes of that game, we had less touches in their box of the four quarters of the match when you're chasing the game. We had crazy. We, we only created one shot with mm -hmm. a 0 0.01 xg. Mm -hmm. uh, we had so few shots a goal, only one with a 10% chance of scoring mm -hmm. uh, in the whole second half, I think. So ultimately, chasing the game one down, it shows you that his, his uh, substitutions going to this shape did not work. I no. will say that. No, no. I come back, though, and I get what you're saying. You're 100% correct. I think he took away, he put players in the positions where they're not, it's not ideal for their strengths. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that ultimately didn't get us the back into the game. Mm -hmm. But I still look at our front line. I still mm -hmm. look at Saka, who are... The corner he put in right at the, the quick free kick, and, the, and uh, I think he took it, didn't he, the quick free Did he take the quick uh, free yeah, kick? Yeah, I think he did. I yeah. think he did. And that corner right That's at the end right. summed up his performance. I yeah. love Bakaya Saka. Yeah, me too. But in this game, he, he didn't, for me, have the desire, the bravery to make something happen, which you'd mm -hmm. want from a player. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm being harsh, but that's what it felt like. I'm just telling you what I felt. Yeah. And then I thought Martinelli as well had a bit of a stinker for me. Uh, yeah. And that chance was a, such a massive chance. I thought Havertz, and to be fair, I wanted him in the team at the weekend. I said that that's what was what was working. I suspect some people in the comments would say, well, you asked for Havertz up top, now you're criticising him. I just didn't think on the night... He imposed himself. He plays it. When he yeah. plays, when we play lesser teams, it's almost like these players know they're better mm -hmm. than a lot of the teams they play against. They know they're going to get lots of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So they feel superior. But when you play against elite teams, you're not going to get the same amount of chances. And this is something we've got to learn really quickly. If this is going to be the group that he keeps, and I think maybe the next evolution for Arteta is an elite striker now, somebody who, who individually can take us to that next level in these tight games, because mm -hmm. that's what we're missing. That's what we've been missing last night. I thought as much as the shape that he went to didn't help us, I didn't think our forward players did enough when they had the opportunities. Just didn't do enough, James, on the night. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at those people. I love them, Saka, Martinelli. Favourite players of mine. I love them to, to bits. The only one for me I thought that was trying to make things happen was Martin Odegaard. Havertz, to me, looked like not the striker we need yeah. last night in that game. And you have to say, does 
Arteta now seriously think about next season replacing Jesus and him and bringing in an elite striker, because if he can get one, of course, because that's what we were missing. You mentioned Bukayo Saka, and I, I want to defend him a little bit, but to do that, you know, just on this whole theme of squad management, I think Saka suffered massively. I want to just read you a tweet from Alex, who you'll all know from the Different Knock YouTube channel. He said, I love Arteta, but every season we end up with only 13 to 14 players he actually trusts. Every summer we sign three to four guys to make that first 16, 17, then end up alienating another three to four. Look at the players this evening, absolutely gassed out. We need to find a way to sort this. I absolutely, utterly agree, because in a game like this, you need a goal and you don't turn to Vieira, you don't turn to Smith Rowe. That is a concern. One's a 35 million pound signing, and the other is a player you've backed massively, given a contract to, and really publicly supported. He didn't turn to these players. Now, a graphic that's been doing the rounds is this. I think it was Sam Dean who first shared it, to be fair. I want to give the right credit, but it's the total minutes played in the Premier League and Champions League for these players, and it is absolutely staggering because you'd expect some of them to play the most. Saliba, Gabriel, Rice, but Erdegaard, Saka, White are up there too. Saka and White, we know, have been playing with injuries. Kai Havertz has played significant minutes, but then there's quite big drops for players like Martinelli, Zinchenko, Jesus. What is Staggering is that Partey, Smith Rowe, Vieira, Nelson, and I'll chuck in Cedric and Elneny there too, have all played less minutes than Aaron Ramsdale, our backup goalkeeper. And that was a point made by Rory Talks Football as well. I mean, you look at that and the balance is all wrong. But And I wanted to add to this discourse because the minutes played, I think, is an issue in terms of Arteta trusting the squad and mixing it up. And he just has a trusted few. That's why the subs annoyed me. Because I'm thinking, you're leaving Havertz and Saka on again. They haven't done anything. Albeit Martinelli hadn't. But why is it always those two that stay on? Why, why is it always Martinelli who comes off? I think, am I going crazy? And I'm not. Now, you're going to have to... Give me the benefit of the doubt here, because I did some number crunching on the train. But I'm 99% sure this is correct, right? If not, I'm off by one or two. But look at this. I've got the front five. They're starts and they're subbed off. And you can see in the top three there, Martin, Jesus and Trossard have started significantly less games than Saka and Havertz. And they've been subbed off way more. Albeit Saka's been subbed off 20 times, but that's why I've got the percentage of times they've been subbed off for the amount of times they've started. Martinelli, Jesus and Trossard have been subbed off 79, 75 and 78 percent of times they've started games. Saka and Havertz 50 and 42. I love Arteta, but don't tell me he doesn't have favourites, people. He does. There are players that, quite frankly, he banks on more to find the answer than others. And at times it's worked. Saka crossing it to the back post to Havertz against Brentford, cool. Havertz with a late goal against Brentford to win at the Emirates. Uh, Stamford Bridge, Saka with the assist for Trossard. I get it. But I look at Martinelli and I feel for him. Maybe he will thrive more in that last 20 minutes of games as Bayern is struggling. Maybe the reason he's not at his best form today, apart from everything tactically we've talked about in this space being left alone, is because he's not starting as many games. He doesn't have the same trust and faith in Arteta. The team isn't coach to or isn't set up to thrive on the left like it is on the right and maybe if you had him later in games like against Palace when he came on he can kill teams that are tiring and I just feel that I feel sorry for Jesus Trossard and Martinelli who've all had criticism in the last week or so I don't think they get the opportunity to shine as much as Havertz and Saka and that for me is not just about looking after those three players it's about managing the squad I don't think Saka I don't think he's benefiting from playing this many minutes. I don't think the other three are benefiting from playing such less minutes. Three players who can pop up with big moments. And I just want to end by showing you this point as well. Saka's FB ref defensive work is so high, as you can see on this graphic. He does so much to help defensively that you think, surely with a player who's having to track back to cover white and then get up the pitch to be our attacking outlet, surely you want depth from the transfer market to help him and help our wingers you know, perform what is a really difficult role in this team, Graham. You've just said it there, I think he wants depth and he's going to have to use the transfer market because clearly he doesn't trust certain players. Certain players he doesn't give minutes to, certain players he doesn't want to take off. So he trusts them more than others. I think, just listening to you speak there, the one thing I will say about Martinelli and Jesus is that they've come back from injuries. And Martinelli's had a very in, true. Martinelli has had an injury hit season. Yeah. That You're doesn't right. excuse him for missing that chance in the middle of the goal last night or being more composed 
and having that ruthlessness, killer instinct to put it away. But his minutes have been managed uh, on the back of injuries early in the season and again that is a good during point. the season. And Jesus has also been injured again. And Jesus, to me, was brilliant when he first came to Arsenal. And I think he's struggling now with an injury which has reduced how good he was. He, mm-hmm. You know, I don't think he's quite at the level now he was when he first came. That knee injury or repeated knee injuries have an effect on him. Where do I see this going? I think Arteta needs to... He's going to have a clear out. And, and, and maybe it's... Think? Yeah, I think so. I, I think there's a discussion... Ruthless summer. I think he's going to be ruthless. I think, I think he is. I, right. I, think, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those players, even Smith Rowe, the fans' favourite, and I love Smith Rowe, uh, but he clearly doesn't trust him. No. And I think there'll be certain players like Smith Rowe, Eddie and Ketia, if he can move them on, he will. And he needs to be really smart in the transfer market. I think we need a, an elite forward, I, and I just don't know where he's going to get one. There are some really good players in teams who might go down or down the bottom of the table, will stay up. You know, the likes, and I'm, he's flaunt, uh, flaunted with the like. Uh, well, we've heard the names like Neto he's been mm. linked with. I know he's injury prone. That's the only worry for me about Neto. But he's somebody, you talked about an individual with quality who can make a difference in the game. He's somebody, him and Saka on that side, you've got two players there that, that, that both basically could manage that side. Neto is a really top player. And then we're being linked to, again, and I, you'll confirm this because you do these shows more than me, to the Nottingham Forest player, aren't we? Gibbs White. Mm. Now, he is a, a good player. They, they're down there fighting to stay up. I'm not saying that... The, <laughs> You know, you, you, and I think Liverpool got to the next level a few years ago. Funny enough, it was with the Alisson Van Dyke signings that come yeah, out of the, Coutinho, being, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Coutinho money. But do you remember they started raiding Southampton for Southampton players? And everyone thought, Southampton, why are you going there? Mm. And a lot of those players like Mane, uh, Lovren, mm-hmm. and even I think... Lallana. Lallana. They, they, they did a job for him. Mm. Uh, and they started getting Liverpool back to where Klopp eventually took them. So I think there's a, an argument for looking at players like Neto and Gibbs White in teams that, like that. But in answer to your question, we're talking about who he trusts. He clearly doesn't trust so many players in this mm-hmm. squad. He only uses the first... He might have 16, 17 you think he trusts, but he only uses 14. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. And that's why these players are fatigued. Why for three successive seasons in April, James, we've fallen away. Mm-hmm. We fell away this time last year. I was in Paris for the weekend when we drew two all with uh, West Ham. Um, the year before, it all unravelled in April, didn't it? When we, I think we lost at Southampton and then we ended up losing at Tottenham and losing at Newcastle. And, and that's because he's got a small squad and he only mm-hmm. trusts certain players. And it's happened again this year. Yeah, I think you're Albeit right. we're still in the Premier League title race. But yeah. I just think that's the issue, really. He's got to get the players he doesn't trust. He's going to have to move on and he's going to have to bring players in he does trust and he's going to have to start rotating players better and giving players less minutes who he's overworking that's why they're fatigued you're absolutely right to mention injuries of course people in the comment section will be screaming about it yes injuries of course have played a part and affect some of the subs and affect um, the minutes for certain players but i don't think it should affect it quite as much as we've seen yeah. um and also, you know, the final point I want to make on all this is, look at Man City, went to the Bernabeu, De Bruyne didn't start, didn't matter, they still scored three goals, you know, Haaland, didn't, Haaland and De Bruyne didn't start at home to Aston Villa when they won 4-1 the other week, but you don't know what you're going to get from City, you, you don't, is Foden on the right, is he on the left, is he central, is Bernardo on the right, is he central, is Haaland even going to start, does De Bruyne start this game there, is it going to be Kovacic, is it going to be Nunes, and that unpredictability is a massive weapon for City. We have to have that next season. Yeah, but I think it comes back to these sort of games. When you get to this level, you're playing against elite teams. It's going to be tight and individuals have to make a difference. You could, Artest is a brilliant manager. He puts in a structure. It's so well coached, Arsenal. You know, we've got to give him credit for that. He set that team up, I think, as well as he could to win the game. And he does at Arsenal every week. It boils down to individuals in these tight games. Mm-hmm. You talked about Man City, you talked about Foden. That brilliant individual goal he scored at Real Madrid when they were losing the game. They were in trouble in the game. Mm. He got them back in the game. Kevin De Bruyne last night, they were losing the game. Brilliant individual goal. This is what we need. Players who individually in tight games can take a game by the scruff of the neck and change it with uh, their individuality. We haven't got that, I think. Enough of those sort of players in this team. We are a great team. He's done wonders, Arteta. And I think... We're back in the Champions League next year and I think we'll be stronger for this experience. But he does need to, I think, find one or two players who in these tight games individually can make a difference. Match winners. Everyone, not the show we wanted to be doing, but 
Well, hopefully we've shed some light on the team. Let me know. Am I being too harsh about the management of the squad, about the rotation of players, the subs? Um, is it just the way it is? Some managers are favourites. That is just how it goes. Um, and actually, on another day, do we take that chance, at, you know, in the first half and beat Villa 3-0 like we should have done that first half and things are looking different. Maybe things aren't as bad as it seems, but I just think we can't ignore this pattern that we're seeing around April. It seems to be happening again, but we can't allow it to continue at Wolves. We have to keep Man City honest. A big thank you to Graham. As always, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. Get in the comment section as well. We'd love to know your thoughts and I will see you next Monday post-Wolves for another Tactical Insight. Catch you in a bit.